Uh, just a moment, I need to um, just get a couple of little props out here. I've got a bag of tricks. Um, this is the only technological trick. So I haven't written everything down, but I do have something that'll help me. So just a moment. <clears throat> uh, this is beautiful. And I made it. Uh, it's quite organic, so it was quite cold and um, sad this morning, and so it's been spent some time by the fire, warming up. <clears throat> so it's got the right tone, and it does change tone depending on where you hit it. I'd really like you to close your eyes. Hopefully, you can hear that as a heartbeat. Perhaps your heartbeat. This is my heartbeat. But this is hopefully your heartbeat. Before I start, can I just acknowledge that we are on Fedora Matung land? And there's probably been Indigenous people here in this part of the world gathering like this listening to each other, sharing stories for tens of thousands of years. And we're just continuing that ancient tradition. Life is a circle when we are all together Like stones on the water, it ripples on forever For life is a circle when we are all together Like stones on the water, it ripples on forever Thank you for that indulgence. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll talk about the Alpine School for, in a little while because I'm the founding principal of the, Al of the Alpine School, which we now call the School for Student Leadership. But I'm also the Mayor of East Gippsland Shire, so I can welcome you to East Gippsland Shire as well. Uh, I made this drum. Uh, because I pursued a Churchill Fellowship and I know there's at least one other person who's a Churchill Fellow here and uh, it was one of my great long-term goals and I made this on Vancouver Island with an amazing fellow called Wade Charlie and uh, it stinks because it's uh, rawhide and it was the most disgusting thing I've ever done is actually have to strip the skin off an animal, strip the fur off it, soak it in an esky for days so I was just on the point of rotting and then stretch it on a drum that, like in the song, is a circle. The song was written by, it's called The Circle Song, and it's written by another guy I met on my Churchill Fellowship travels, a bloke called Professor David Lertzman. David Lertzman, 
is the world's only Jewish First Nation stony Blackfoot person I've ever met. <laughs> and he is crazy. And he wrote that song when he was running uh, what was called um, Ghost River Rediscovery. And uh, through my Churchill Fellowship, I met him and was embedded in a program with him high up in the Rockies at Kananaskis. And it was just such a privileged opportunity. And I'll tell you those stories because they've been absolutely fundamental in what's happened to the Alpine School and what I've been able to bring back. But um, life is a circle. And it goes on forever. The world's a circle. The world circulates around the sun. First Nation people were pretty keen on circles. Have a look at this. And if you look at just about any Indigenous art around the world, the key point and the key focal point of that Indigenous art is circles. It brings us back um, to that particular point, sitting around fires, sitting around telling stories. And in fact, the words of that song, um, I'll carry you always in my heart, if you think about it, the heart is the fundamental part of the circulatory system which keeps us alive. It's a beautiful song and, I, and I, I really love it and I don't sing it very often, so you're very privileged to hear it. Um, so thanks David and thanks um, Wade Charlie for that. What I was going to talk about today though, I think is uh, leadership, because that's what I tend to do. Oh, I also meant to mention that as a, as a mayor and as a local government politician, our council table is a circle. We sit around a circle and collaborative decision making is absolutely essential. These bloody circles keep reappearing wherever I go. So I want to talk about leadership because that's what I tend to do and that's what I found myself doing and the school I run, the Alpine School, we now call the School for Student Leadership, simple as that. Um, and really, provocatively, leadership's about power. There's, there's no other way I can uh, distill it down any simpler than that. Leadership's about power, but there's two types of power, good power and bad power, power over, power with, Empowerment is what we're really trying to do. That's, that's good leadership. And um, leadership to me is a doing word. And I keep telling my students that, that forget all the titles and forget everything else. Leadership's about doing. It's a verb. Simple as that. So you do leadership. Go and do leadership. So the, the four, three or four points that I want you to just to think about while I'm telling my story today is, yep, leadership's a verb. Um, Nothing happens unless you make it happen. Uh, surround yourself with great people. Sometimes action precedes strategy. You have to actually take the step and do something sometimes. You can't just keep planning ad infinitum. Set long-term goals and stick to them and keep them in sight. And persistence and patience are the keys. Right, now as a mayor, mayors love opening things. My neighbours tell me that I'd uh, go to the opening of a door. So, <laughs> mayors have plaques. And so here's the, um, the plaque from the Alpine School when we opened it way back in 2000. And uh, I've actually got a problem with plaques because I stuff them up pretty often and that's why I've got this one. Um, I got the minister's name wrong. So, <laughs> I, uh, her title actually at the time and, and when I look back on that event, and it was terrifying at the time, the little curtain wouldn't open, the bloody thing <laughs> fell over, and then when we finally got it open, the title of the minister was wrong. And so I thought, this, I'm going to keep this, and we'll redo it and stick it up on the wall. So I want to pass that round, because you don't often see plaques. They're usually screwed to things, don't you? And they're quite heavy. So here's the plaque for the opening of the Alpine School. The Alpine School is a school that should never have existed, and there's at least four reasons why. Way back in 1998, the then Education Minister, a really decent fella at the, the declining years of the Kennett government, um, a fella called Phil Good, said to a couple of his secretaries, why haven't we got a timber top in government education? Why isn't there timber top like, a timber top like school in government education? They all scratched their head and said, well, it costs a heap and da 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 and whatever else. And mind you, the, the Department of Education is a sausage machine. Now you put the numbers in one end and out pops the result. Got a shire of Wyndham, they've got 10,000 new kids turning up. You put those numbers in and it pops up and says you need to build a school there, 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 there. But there's no sausage machine algorithm in the Department of Education that says you need a timber top. Except 
that the outcomes for kids at year nine are crap. They're at a, their peak when they're in grade six, they go to secondary college and we spend three years knocking the hell out of them so they hate school in three years' time. So that's good enough reason. Phil Goode said that. First reason um, he, the school should not have existed is he, he went to Treasury and said, I need $1.8 million. They said, go jump. You know, we haven't got $1.8 million to fix the dunnies in the schools around the state. OK. He went to Cabinet thinking, if I went to Cabinet and got my colleagues behind it, the weight would get those people uh, across the line. Cabinet knocked him back. So Kenneth said, no, not a chance. So he said, I'm going to wing it alone. He went back to the Education Department, so the Department, not Treasury, and said to his secretary, I need $1.8 million, can you find it? Now this is a time when the Department of Education had been slashed and burned and teachers had been cut and he was saying, I need $1.8 million for this elite school up in the Victorian Alps. How do you reckon that went down with most of the principals in the state? <laughs> Not too well. But he got it across the line. And then December 1999 happened. There was a change of government. I'd just been appointed as the new principal. We were building the school and suddenly we had a new school that smelt a lot like Kennet. And I thought, we're screwed. That's number three. You know, first two reasons I can understand. We got across the line, change of government, and suddenly Brax embraced it and said, this is just the sort of egalitarian stuff we need. Government school kids having those opportunities. So off we went. And it was a great fanfare and fantastic. The, the times were really good. Um, and, um, and we continued. Now, after a couple of years of running, I was getting, doing a lot of research. We had a research project with Monash Uni, which continues, and we've co-published 12 or 14 uh, peer-reviewed papers around the world. And we had amazing data. Remember, Year 9 kids' data is down here, 25th percentile. We were getting data, 95th percentile. It was just through the roof. And I had a great working relationship then with the Education Minister, and I said to Lynn, look at this data. It is just unbelievable. I don't know what we're doing. Action precedes strategy. I don't know what we're doing, but we're doing it really well. And Lynn said, Mark, if we win the next election, will you build two more of these? Are you kidding? Of course I will. Uh, that was in 2002. They won the election. So suddenly we had another six or seven million dollars and an opportunity to go and find a couple more sites. We did that. The fourth time the Alpine School didn't exist was in 2003 and the big fires uh, up here in the Alps, and it nearly burnt down. And it was, uh, it was a really traumatic time for many of us who lived up here. I lived at Dinner Plain at the time, and I can remember vividly a line of sentinels of New Zealand firefighters standing with rake hose defending the Alpine School. You now we'd worked so hard to get this thing built and get it up, and the bloody thing was going to burn down. Not a chance, but it didn't, thank God. And um, the only thing that did happen was probably one of the most traumatic things that ever happened to me is I was nearly killed in a fire truck um, in that same fire campaign down at Kabunga, which is only over the hills a couple, a couple of valleys away. And uh, at the time, I didn't realise the, the significance of the event, but it was only a year later when a couple of my colleagues who were in the truck with me said, Mark, I thought we were going to die that day. And, and it's only in re reflection that I think we nearly did die that day. So... The story of the Alpine School continues and about and we started building the new schools, a new campus down at Marlow and I was analysing the students who were coming. Who were these kids? They were white Anglo-Saxon kids. Where were the Indigenous kids? We had one or two who identified in the first thousand. I thought, this, this is not good. You know, what are you doing, Mark? You're running this apartheid leadership program. Do what I normally do, go and ask someone. Surround yourself with great people. Went straight to the Department of Education because there was an amazing guy who was running the Curie Strategy Unit, Mark Rose. Mark Rose is amazing. He's the first Indigenous guy to do his PhD using Indigenous knowledge systems. Awesome. Just the person I needed. He's now on my school council. I've recruited him onto the school council and uh, we, we're affectionately known as the Marx Brothers, Harpo and Groucho. <laughs> yada, yada, yada. So, um, so Mark grabbed me by the hand literally and said, we've got to go down to the Victorian Aboriginal Education Association, tell the story. The rest is history. We actually ran an Indigenous-specific program with a whole lot of um, 
specific outcomes around in, in getting those kids into our program, but also engendering the trust of the Indigenous community across Victoria. And now we have between 20 and 40 Indigenous kids a year participate in our program, which is just fantastic. So that's another winner. And now I'm on the, the, what, uh, the board of a, an organisation called the, uh, the um, Curie Academy of Excellence, which is an, a virtual academy that, um, that runs out of Victoria, and we get, we get a lot of kids through there. We opened the second campus of Snowy River Campus. I got another plaque because I stuffed this one up as well. <laughs> This, this Friday night before John Lenders was coming down to open it, I said to my Department of Education colleagues, so, you got the plaque? And they said, what fucking plaque? You were doing the plaque. Didn't have a plaque. So a local guy cobbled one up, up in Orbost for me and we were able to stick this on a something or other. And, and I told the story to John, who's a really decent guy, and he said, it wouldn't have mattered, Mark. I would have opened anything anyway. You know, I came down to open the school, not a plaque. So there's, there's a cheap plaque, you can pass that around. <laughs> um, when we opened the third school, Nurad Gundij campus out in the Western District at Glen Ormiston, I thought, I'm not going to stuff up the plaque. This time I'm going to get it right. And I did get it right. The trouble is, we were due to open it, the school, and have our first intake on what turned out to be the weekend of Black Saturday. And through an amazing bit of prescience, I don't know, we decided Let's delay it for a week. So we did. Anyway, the school's up and running and going beautifully. So we've got three campuses. It's just an amazing story in that time. Three campuses. Now we have 550 kids from across Victoria come through. Many years ago, um, I had a mentor who was a deputy commissioner of police and he had a trophy cabinet in his office down there in St Kilda Road. And front and centre of his trophy cabinet was one of these. And I'm going to pass it round. It's actually not a bad thing to show today because given Anzac Day, Winston Churchill was the architect of Anzac, if you're not aware. So he was the Lord of the Admiralty at the time, 1915. And um, Gary said to me, Mark, one day you need to do a Churchill Fellowship. And this is the mention about patience and persistence. You can't just rush out and say, I'm going to do it. You need to get a whole lot of things right, such as building your capacity, building your reputation and... I applied once and, was, and I got a Churchill Fellowship in 2010 and my particular interest was around the contemporary education's um, use or, or the, the response of the contemporary education to adolescent rite of passage, which is a bit of a juicy topic and hence my interest in First Nations stuff because they do it really well. You know, traditionally, they do rites of passage really well. And I'll tell that story because all the data I was getting, all the... Um, feedback I was getting from students and parents were telling me this single word, this experience is transformational. There was something happening that was transformational. And when I started doing research around transformation and learning, it kept bringing back this notion of rites of passage. One of the great things that then happened out of that in the Churchill Fellowship was that uh, it really fundamentally redefined the way we talk about our school as, a, as an organisation. And again, it's around circles. And uh, we have the golden circle approach now. When we talk about our school, we start with the why, the centre of the circle. Why do we run a school like this? Because teenagers need a fundamental rite of passage. The next circle is how, well, how you do it is you have a school like ours and take kids away from their normal environment. What we do is the activities on a day-to-day -day basis. In the past, when somebody asked, what, you know, tell me about your school, we concentrated on the what, the activities. Now we talk about the why. And I think that's one of the fundamental things. I'm going to um, wrap up now by saying, um, out of all of that, um, local government and politics was, to me, a, um, a really easy convergence. And that's another leadership um, capability, I think timing and persistence and patience and wait for the right time. And so I was elected to local government um, in 2012 on my first, first go. Um, and then I was elected mayor after one year. And uh, it still shocks me at times because I, sometimes I think I don't really know what I'm doing the next day, but I'll do it anyway. And, um, and I think that the, the powers of a mayor and the powers of a principal are really quite significant. There's quite enormous delegations. 
And I'm going to sum up by saying, as I've made my way through my career and have had quite significant achievements, I think, and I'm not blowing my own trumpet, I'm just saying, look, you know, it's, it's been fantastic, but I haven't done it alone, is that um, the more that you have success, the more people want to tell you what to do. And I'll, I'll explain it like this. The number of people now who tell me as mayor, do you know what you should do? And as school principal, you know, it's run a pretty damn successful school and just about to launch into China, the number of people who say, Mark, do you know what you should do with the Alpine School? Well, I think we've done it. And that's the story I'd like to tell. So thanks for the opportunity today.